Welcome to session four of this FAME webinar on archaeological archives. Deb and Kat have explained how we process and look after each archive, which leaves me with the fun bit, showing you some of the many ways that museums try to make them accessible to everyone. But first, a bit of background about me. My name is Kate Isles and I'm the Curator of Archaeology for Bristol Culture. We run two major museums, three historic houses, the City Archive Service, an arts and festivals team, a film studio and one small Roman villa. We collect archives from the counties of Bristol and South Gloucestershire and can collect anything up to 100 sites a year. In total, we estimate that we look after 2 million different groups of objects. The first thing we do to make archaeological archives accessible is make sure that information is available on our online catalogues. This means that researchers and members of the public can see what we have and find out more information. This online catalogue is the first place that we direct people to when they want to research our collections or find out about the archaeology in our area. The information you'll find on museum catalogues ranges from one record per site with information on the site's location, the type of fieldwork and the details of the unit to thousands per site with individual records for each small find. The level of detail we record is often down to how much information we're presented with by each archaeological unit. We get research inquiries from a whole range of people who want to come in and access archaeological archives. Local societies or community groups are often interested in a certain area and want to see all archives from a specific place, or they want to use some of our reference collections to help understand the material that they have, like the Tutan Mendip Archaeology Group, who visited recently so that they could develop their own online pottery fabric type series. University researchers, particularly PhD candidates, also use the archaeological archives frequently. Some carry out scientific analysis on very specific material, like this example from Newport Museum in the bottom left of the screen, which shows isotope analysis undertaken by Redden University on an excavated aurop bone whilst other PhD candidates choose to work on a whole assemblage and spend a lot longer using the archives. Bristol Museum are currently hosting a PhD placement from the Universities of Bristol and Cardiff, and this research involves comparing material from several Bristol sites with similar sites in Copenhagen. The number of PhD research requests vary from museum to museum and from year to year, but Wiltshire and Salisbury museums have just started a project to synthesise 10 years worth of PhD studies on their collection and this amounts to over 200 researchers and although their collections are very high profile you get a real sense of demand. Other research is at a more regional or national level. Here archaeological archives are used for broader pieces of work like the Paleolithic Rivers of South West Britain project which synthesised the archaeological evidence for the Lower and Middle Paleolithic occupation of South West Britain. The project involves studying all relevant archaeological material from seven museums across the South West, and you can see the results, including data sets of all the objects on the Archaeology Data Service. Although these kinds of projects are less frequent than local groups or PhD researchers, they place the archaeological archive in a much wider framework. Occasionally, the collections are also studied at an international level, and recently researchers from Germany came to sample Bristol's Roman lead pigs to compare them with other examples from across Europe. But research isn't the only use we have for archaeological archives. We also regularly use the material generated from fieldwork to teach undergraduate students and run different sessions for the University of Bristol. In the left hand picture you can see students working on an artefact study where they're asked to choose an object from the archives, which they then study, draw, photograph, and create a poster presentation for. To the right, you can see a range of objects used to teach students about material culture from various archeological periods. We also use the archives to teach students how to create the perfect archeological archive. Various parts of the archive are also used in the work we do in a formal learning setting with schools. We take material into school and run sessions that tie into the national curriculum on topics such as Stone Age to Iron Age, the Romans, the Saxons and local history. We run CPD sessions for teachers 
where we show them how to use archaeology in the classroom and provide an image bank of objects that they can use in their teaching. We have also run archaeology after school clubs where we train students up to be mini archaeologists and show them how to handle, draw and record a whole range of archaeological finds. Sometimes we run one-off school projects with certain groups that look more closely at one site or one type of archive. These pictures are from a project we ran with students from Elmtree School for Deaf Children. We received funding from the Worshipful Company of Dyers for a project that involved looking at Bristol's medieval cloth industry and creating an artistic response to it for a display at Emshed, one of our major museum sites. We worked with a local stained glass artist and ran sessions that involved looking at the archaeological material, a trip to a local stained glass studio, a visit to a glass blowing factory and a session for the children to design their own stained glass. The artists then took their ideas and designed the work that you can see in the top right hand corner. It includes water which represents the harbour and the ships that sailed with cloth to and from the port, a woad plant to represent the dyeing that happens in medieval Bristol, a Catherine wheel as the kids loved that she was the patron saint of weavers, woven warp and weft in the background and handprints which represented the students involved and the sign language that they all used. We also run a learning programme aimed at adults and deliver a series of archaeology study days throughout the year. Many of these involve using parts of the collection for teaching and this is usually the most popular part. You can see a session involving sorting and classifying animal and human bones in a forensic archaeology session in the top right hand corner and more of an artistic response in a human evolution session in the left hand corner where participants started sketching and painting the material. These study days range from outdoor experimental sessions to sessions that focus on particular time periods or objects. We've also started to run our own series of field schools with a local archaeology company. As well as the digging, these field schools also involve time at the museum, learning about how finds are sorted, recorded and stored in a museum setting. Obviously this year's programme was postponed due to COVID, but we're about to begin scheduling our next set of winter sessions, which will all be digital. A lot of what we do is aimed at families, non-specialists and the general public, and the archaeological archive is invaluable for this kind of outreach. The most obvious example is through exhibition. These are broadly divided into permanent displays that tend to be up for a number of years, or more likely decades, and temporary exhibitions that are only on for a limited amount of time. Our permanent archaeology displays are mainly at Emshed and focus on Bristol's archaeology. They include material that was literally coming out the ground as we were designing it. To the left you can see a medieval barrel being excavated just before Emshed opened and to the right you can see the barrel in situ next to the medieval doorway. It was only just conserved in time. Obviously not all of the archaeological archive is displayable in this way. Because they're often large with lots of broken pottery or animal bone, with lots of plans and paperwork, there'll always be a large part of the archive that doesn't make it to exhibition. But this doesn't mean that the information generated doesn't. Below you can see a whole section of one of the galleries in Emshed that looks at the city's expansion over time. Almost all of the information to create this display came from the historic environment record and in turn from the many excavations that have taken place over the years. Temporary or touring exhibitions also feature objects and information from the archives. Skeletons are buried bones was a touring exhibition from the Museum of London, which took six skeletons from London and six skeletons from the host venue. It then looked in detail at what these human remains could tell us about each person and their story. All six of the skeletons from Bristol's collection were from archaeological archives, and the information that came from each excavation helped us to tell the story of the individual and made it a really in-depth experience for all our visitors. Other touring exhibitions focus on specific time periods and provide an opportunity to display local material alongside national collections. When the Roman Empire Power and People exhibition came to Bristol from the British Museum, we made sure Roman material from the local archaeological archives were included for everyone to see. The same exhibition then went to Leeds Museum and you can see from this picture 
the local material they displayed to the right of the screen. We also help with much smaller scale exhibitions, like the one you can see in the bottom left hand corner, which was a very short term display in a cafe at one of Bristol's parks where a local community excavation was happening. We also use the archaeological archive for fun. We run a branch of the Young Archaeologists Club and tend to use the objects as a source of inspiration. We've done plenty of site visits to see archaeology in action and the kids are always very good at spotting what professionals have missed on the spoil heap. But in the museum we tend to get more crafty. We've done plenty of object drawing, photography and sorting using material from the archives, as well as more creative sessions that have involved monument building in sugar cubes, cave art, burial junk modelling, painting and general mummification. With the addition of a new brownie archaeology badge, we've also been offering Saturday brownie sessions, which involve finding, recording and drawing some of the unstratified material from real excavations. And of course, there are the more regular activities that we do that use or show off the archaeological archives in our care. Here's Kat giving a tour of the Leeds Discovery Centre, brandishing a piece of Roman carved marble. And on the right are some of our volunteers at a handling table where visitors can ask questions and pick up some real archaeology. We also used to have a regular programme of talks within the museum. These have stopped with Covid, so we now run a regular series of lunchtime and evening lectures that focus on archaeology and the archaeological collections. We've just started a new initiative and teamed up with three of the local societies in our region to jointly host Archaeology Online, which helps them deliver a digital programme and promote themselves in these uncertain times. Our first lecture was fully booked, with just over 300 people signing up. Or there are other initiatives to show off what happens behind the scenes like the very successful Museum of London's Archive Lottery. Run through social media, this involves the public sending in a shelf location and being shown part of the archive that lives there, including on occasion an empty shelf. And we're not opposed to taking it to extremes and the length we'll go to to get people involved in archaeology. On the left are Kat's cake axe heads she made as part of an object cake initiative run and also eaten by the staff at Lee's Museum. In the middle are embroidered versions of the Staffordshire Hoard to go with the exhibition when it came to Bristol. These were made by our amazing archaeology costume group who make us costumes for kids to try on. We also have an archaeology cooking group that put on tasty feasts. And finally, the other big thing that we do to get people involved in archaeology, but also that uses the archaeology collections is put on large events like this one, Bristol's Brilliant Archaeology, which is part of the National Festival of Archaeology. This is a massive event with over 25 different archaeological groups, including a range of field units who come together to put on a day of family fun. Each group has a stall and provides an activity or mini display as we try to promote and celebrate everything archaeological in Bristol and a little bit beyond. This year, of course, the whole event went digital and instead of lasting a day, it lasted nine long days. It was a massive learning curve. We had to master the technology and try to include as many different groups as we possibly could. But I think we found some good solutions that we'll definitely try to keep going in the future. To include all the field units and their work, we started a digital dig board using Padlet and added various films, 3D models and anything else that had been created recently. We made another digital board with family friendly activities, online puzzles using images of objects, colouring in sheets of artefacts and mini films showing you how to dress your teddy in a toga. We also created films about the different jobs archaeologists do and tried to make sure that everyone was included. We put as much on our social media channels as we could, including films made by our reenactors and info about objects from the archives. And this is something we now try to do as regularly as possible. It's a great way of showing people objects that aren't on display or objects that might not look that impressive, but have an amazing story to tell. And finally, we created a series of Instagram stories. Some were recipes based on archaeological foods and others were stories about different digs. 
These are probably the most popular Instagram stories we've created so far and definitely something we'd like to do more of in the future. It was a great way to get information out there about the archaeology happening in the city right now and a nice way for museums and units to stay connected and promote each other. So I hope this has shown you a few of the things that we do with the archaeological archive after it gets deposited at a museum. This list isn't exhaustive and there are plenty of examples from across the country where museums are using the archive in new and exciting ways. Much of what can be achieved depends on staff resources, time and budgets, but in the digital age I think there's real potential for museums and archaeological units to work together to promote archaeology and the archive to a much wider audience. Thank you.